Hey, everybody, Bobby Medina here with my very good friend, Paul Barron, and we are bringing you a an extra, extra special interview with uh, somebody who is, uh, I consider my mentor and somebody who's an inspiration to thousands, if not millions of trumpet players all over the, uh, all over the earth. He's originally from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, started playing trumpet uh, when he was just uh, around 10, self-taught. He has uh, been the jazz trumpet soloist in the famed NORAD band. He's been, uh, well, he's been with so many different acts and bands and things, it's, it's hard to put them all on one page. But just to name a few, Tommy Dorsey, Woody Herman, Buddy, Buddy Rich. Uh, back when I was a kid, I remember him being one of the top call studio musicians in LA. I used to run home every day after high school just to listen to the opening solo, flugelhorn solo on the Bob Newhart show. Uh, he played for Hawaii Five-0, Streets of San Francisco, uh, he, all those Don Kirshner rock concerts uh, that you see uh, being redone on DVDs now. He was on all those shows. Uh, lead player for many stars, uh, played in Vegas for years. And of course, he's played with so many wonderful jazz musicians, uh, Art Pepper, Bud Shank, Horace Silver, Louis Belson, that list goes on forever. He has uh, a number of his own CDs uh, that are just fabulous. He has uh, Outstanding in His Field, which is the first one I think uh, I heard. And I think that was Grammy nominated. One of my favorite uh, albums of all time. It's one of those, uh, if you only could take a couple albums on a desert island, this would be one. And that's uh, uh, Bobby Shue with the Metropole Orchestra. I just love that recording. Uh, and a whole bunch of other ones. He's a Yamaha artist. And uh, Wayne Bergeron just recently said here on our group that Bobby is the greatest brass educator in over 100 years and the coolest guy ever. Welcome, Bobby Shu. <laughs> How much did I have to pay Wayne to say that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we all, we're all in agreement here. We have a mutual admiration society here. That's very humbling. I have to say, I, I'm just I'm just a kid trying to learn to play. That's all. You know? <laughs> hey, Bobby, thanks for being with us. And you know, um, th the other Bobby <laughs> talked all about uh, many of your accolades as a trumpet player, um, but we also know you as a great jazz educator, trumpet educator as well. But um, some of the questions that we've had on our our page. Uh, preempting this interview with you was uh, asking about your style of education and so on. And it got me thinking um, about jazz education from the time that you first started doing your master classes up until about now. I mean, internet has come in and all these other things. Um, can you tell us about the evolution of uh, jazz education as you see it and your involvement in it? Well, I, without, Try to, I'll try to summate this as quickly as I can. I know that was a big question. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm famous for long answers, but I will try to <laughs> summate this. You know, I'll I'll get the scissors out and sniff here. <laughs> but the first uh, the first real kind of jazz workshop that ever happened on planet Earth, aside from there was a guy Marshall Brown up in the Providence, Rhode Island, Rhode Island area that did some things with some kids back in about 1956, 57, somewhere around there. But the first jazz workshop was a Stan Kenton stage band camp in Bloomington, Indiana, 1959. And I, I, when I was in high school, I you know, was some downbeat subscriber. I saw an ad for it. And I said, I don't know what this is, but I'm going. You know, so I, I paid my $75 and got in my 55 Chevy and drove to wherever. Let's find out where Bloomington, Indiana is, you know. <laughs> I went back there and it was really great. Don Jacoby was a trumpet teacher and, and uh, you know, Shelly Mann was the drum teacher. And it was like, uh, I, I was in a band led by John Laporta, the great alto teacher that taught at Berkeley School of Music. Anyway, it was one of the first jazz education things. I went there again in 1960. And uh, it was like 
a lot of the teachers didn't know really what they were doing, but they put together these big bands and, and we had a few combos and we had theory classes and, and we did all kinds of things. I was so inspired by that because there was, this was, there was no jazz allowed in any schools back in those days. You know, it was absolutely forbidden. If you even, I was very fortunate in my high school, I had a classical clarinet player for a band director from my ninth, 10th and 11th grade in high school. And he was very supportive of me, knew I was into jazz and he wasn't a jazzer, but he knew how much I loved it. So he allowed me to organize a bunch of players around the city of Albuquerque. And he'd let me use the high school band room every couple of weeks and we'd all gather and I'd buy these Johnny Warrington charts for $1.50 or $2 and we'd get together and, and play, you know? So I was right, like so into it. I played my first gig when I was 12 years old for a wedding. You know, and uh, so I've been totally enthralled by the whole thing about music in general, but more so the improvisation, you know, thing which stirs up something inside of you that playing the Hummel doesn't do, you know, or playing uh, Sue the Marches. You know, there's something about the creative side of the cerebrum in your brain. There's some elements that get activated when you're actually closing your eyes and cre creating. So anyway, back to the point. I mean, I started, I gave my first trumpet lesson to a little kid by the name of Joe Ais, uh, blocked down the street from me in Albuquerque when he was about nine years old. His mom knew I played and she called me up and said, give him a lesson. I said, I, I don't know how to teach. She said, well, how can you play? I said, I don't know. And she said, well, show him something. So I went to his first lesson. I showed him the C scale. He hated it, rightfully so, you know. And so the second lesson, he saw me come in for the lesson. And, and uh, I've told this story a few times, and so I apologize. But uh, as I walked into his living room for the second lesson, I saw a Louis Armstrong LP on the coffee table. So I said, is that your album? He says, no, it's my dad's. I said, you ever listen to it? No. I, said, well, yeah, I thought... Hmm. We got into his little bedroom or den or wherever it was. We did the lesson. And I said, you know, that guy, that Louis Armstrong guy there, you know, that C scale. And the guy goes, yeah. You know, I said, well, he uses the first five notes of that scale. Da, do, 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 do. And on those five notes only, he plays a very nice little song. It's called, he goes one, three, four, five, one, three, four, five, one, three, four, five, three, one, three, two. Do, do, do. And I taught him to play, hey, go marching in. And the kid was the happiest kid on the block. You, know, you think? So I had this great big light bulb. It took years, to be honest with you, before the light bulb went on over my head. Teach music and bring the trumpet up to the music. Don't just teach the trumpet because if you just force a guy into mouthpieces, valve oil and, and scales and don't you miss a note, little Joey, well, then you put him into the fear factor thing. The amygdala part of his brain dominates and he's terrified. And who in the hell is going to have fun being terrified all the time, worried about missing notes? And the truth about it is Shaquille O'Neal had to miss a whole lot of baskets before he figured out how to get them. And so we have to learn how to, when we miss a note, it's not a mistake. You don't go to trumpet prison for this. You learn <laughs> how to make adjustments with your breathing or your chops or something in order to, to learn to be more accurate. We all want to be accurate, but you can't sit there and have, and have your so-called butt cheeks so tight together that you're afraid to play, you know, it makes you withdraw and hold everything back. That affects your, your breathing gets shallow, your nervous system gets uptight, you know, your eyes get closer together. I mean, <laughs> your brain goes into a negative state of mind, you know, and this is really, in my 66 years of teaching now, and I say teaching with quotes around it because we don't really teach, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but in the 66 years I've been doing this, uh, just when I think I've seen everything, I get surprised again. But the biggest flaw that I see with almost all of the students that come to me, no matter whether they're 10, 12, 13 years old or 83, uh, they're still afraid. 
and they're still they still got that caution flag up like oh god i hope i don't miss a note and it affects the way they practice because the most people go in and they'll open up a piece of music and play and hope like hope to god i can get through this without missing any notes well they don't it they might get through the technical side of not missing any notes on it but where the hell is the music maybe they play it without any emotion you know maybe it just all of the notes pop out and so yeah, yeah, good. Okay, Bobby. You know, I mean, you know what I mean. That's not what the music is all about. So, I mean, I'm I'm really like a rabble rouser when it comes to an awful lot of the the things. You know, I see band directors that scream at kids and and uh, you know, marching drills and get those bells up and all of that stuff. You know, and eight to five and oh my god you know <laughs> and it's like no wonder kids drop out of band you know I mean, god it's like a, it's like camp pendleton or something you know and you know uh, my high school oh sorry i was just gonna interject something here years ago my high school we we brought uh somehow they brought maynard ferguson and his band out, we hosted him, and he did a little clinic for us uh, backstage uh, before the concert. And uh, somebody asked him about this, this, you know, well, how do you feel when you miss a note and this and that? And he just said, you know, once you play the note, it's, it's gone, it's in the ether. What good does it do you to worry about it at that point? He says, think about it. He yeah. says, if we were baseball players, he says, a baseball player, if he's got a 333 average, he says, that means he's got a pretty darn good batting average. And that means he only hits three out of 10 balls thrown at him. So if we had that kind of an average, we'd be horrible. So I, that's well, always kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, you know, I mean, yeah, but it's, it's always stuck with me. So it's kind of along the, these lines, you know. Well, I mean, I think that's one of the beautiful things about jazz music is that, you know, it, it comes right back to Shakespeare, you know, to, it's, it, to air is human, you know. We, and there is no such thing as perfection, you know, because if you, if you really start studying science, like atoms and molecules and things of that sort, and you start taking a look at what perfection is, well, perfection is actually not a, a, a great thing to attain because nothing else can be achieved. It stops everything. You know, you can't improve from the state of perfection, so you'll never get out of bed again. Why take another breath? You know, why eat another hot dog or have another beer? You have no reason to ever have anything else to live for once you've achieved perfection. The good news is that it's impossible. So don't even try. And, you know, I, 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 like, I, I don't really write books, you know, but I have a, a thing that's called a basic study guide. I want to show you the last page in the book. It says, the pursuit of excellence, no, no, the pursuit of, Excellence is gratifying, healthy, and what well, I can't read it upside down. Oh yeah, and the pursuit of excellence is gratifying and healthy. Okay, the pursuit of excellence is trying to get better, trying to get better, a nickel here, a dime there, a penny there, a $5 bill occasionally, you know? But at the bottom of the page it says, the pursuit of perfection is frustrating, neurotic, and a total waste of time, <laughs> you know? You know, a terrible waste of time. The thing about it is when you go into, when you take a look at yourself and your relationship with music, and if all you're trying to do is just try to achieve that perfect state where, and try to make people like you, you think you need to spend some time in Couch Canyon, man. You know, you need to get yourself a shrink and get in there and talk about, I didn't get a choo-choo train when I was a little kid or something, you know, or <laughs> what, is, what, what is it that's bothering you, you know, but, but w w music is an ancient form of prayer and chanting, you know, if we go back to primordial times, you know, before, before, you know, there was a thing, you know, entertainment and music and CDs and all that, music was when people lived in a state of mystery before they even knew there was a science, everything was superstition, you know? So when a pterodactyl attacked you or a saber-toothed tiger approached your cave door, you you went, oh my God, oh, who, 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 who,
get the hell away from <laughs> here, you know, or something, you know, but it's, we go inside of ourselves when we have fear and when we have uncertainty and so forth. And it's a form of prayer. Oh, please. Oh, please. Let me find the answer to this. That's where music came from, you see. And it's, it is a, a form of ancient prayer. So when you, one of the things about jazz that's so beautiful is that you go inside of yourself and the imperfections of us as humans are, are, are many, you know, and plus the variables are countless. You can't, you cannot find two identical people on this, in this planet. Or if, if there's others on other planets, you ain't going to find two alike. It's impossible. It's genetically impossible. You know, they can, you can have two that look awful damn close, but if you do a little bit of deeper and uh, closer look at the genes, you'll find variables, you know? And so the thing about it is in the ancient Greek, you know, in ancient Greece, when they had the great halls of learning and all of that, as you entered the place, and I, it, I don't write Greek or anything like that, but it said, know thyself. You know, this was one of the goals of any form of what you want to call a religion or any kind of thing like that is to get to know who you are, find your voice. And the one beautiful thing about jazz music is that it damn near insists that you do that, you know? And not only does it insist, but it allows you to do that. It gives you a sense of the, the freedom to find out who the hell you are, you know? When we start in, especially in, in I mean, any form of music, you're influenced by, if you're a classical player, you're gonna be influenced by, by, you know, the people like Maurice Andre and great players like Del Stegers or Herbert L. Clark, and you're gonna get their urban book and you're gonna go all of that, you know? And then you hear people like somebody like, you know, uh, like an Alan Zudi or a Doc Severinsen and people like this who are such astonishing virtuosos, you know, I mean, when this guy, Sergei Nakaryakov from Russia and ones like that, you know, there's so many out there that we've listened to over the years. You go back, you know, Don Jacoby, for God's sake, was, was a monster player, you know, and anyway, the point being that we're influenced by those guys, where we go wrong is that we try to be them. And if you try to be, if you play a piccolo trumpet, you're going to learn from Maurice Andre some, some things about his playing that will astonish you and inspire you. But when you go in a room to practice, if you try to be Maurice Andre, uh, you're going to have to probably, if you're going to really try to be Maurice Andre, you're going to probably have to get larger clothes. You know, for first, first and foremost, and you're gonna have to move to France, and, you know. And but, but you get the point is the, the when, when I grew up listening to jazz records and things, I was influenced by uh, Don Fagerquist, was the first jazz trumpet player I heard on a Les Brown recording. And uh, my god, very few people even know who Don Fagerquist is. These trumpet players coming up today, they're all they're all freaking out about. Mr. X or Mr. Y or Mr. Z, I won't drop any names here, but you know who they are. <laughs> uh, but the thing about it is that you get influenced by those people and that's good and that's necessary. But, you know, Chet Baker and Clifford Brown and Kenny Dorham and all of these people came along and, and inspired me. One of the people who a lot of people are shocked when I mention his name is Bobby Hackett. If you want to hear somebody know how to play the melody, you check out Bobby Hackett. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's like, wait a minute, you know? And, but the point about it is those people influence you and they, it's like input output. So you have a whole lot of stuff that comes into you for a while. And then as you, are processing it, it starts to trim away and you start to find your own way of interpreting that material that you get, you know, like transcribing if you do it. Some people do it by physical pencil and paper. I never did, well, I won't say I never because that's an absolute sort of a word. I did transcribe the album Chuck Finley and I did uh, where we played uh, a couple of Clifford Brown solos on uh, Joy Spring and, uh, and what's the other one? Uh, Jordu, was it? No, no, it's um, 
confirmation uh, no, Brown, uh, no brownie speaks brownie speaks yeah yeah and that's a hard one man and i transcribed that entire solo and i went oh boy that was like a challenge you know man but i remember going to to dante's to watch you guys the first time you did that uh there and that was just a night that's ingrained in my memory forever it was phenomenal oh. Well, the fact that, you know, I tra was able to transcribe, well, I can transcribe pretty, pretty easily, but I usually transcribe by ear and I just could play it back. You know, I didn't write a lot out, but I had to write it out for, so that Chuck and I, we had parts in front of us, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, act, the point is after a while, you find your own way of interpreting uh, and finding your way of playing autumn leaves or whatever it is. Now, even when uh, people like um, certain people in the classical field, I'm not an expert in that field and I'm not really a classically trained player. I can't double tongue and triple tongue. And the reason is I can't, I'm not very good with golf clubs either because I don't play golf and I don't go out and hit a bucket of balls because what the hell for? I don't play golf. Why am I going to do that? Why am I going to double tongue? What? Through like autumn leaves? <laughs> No, I don't think so, you know? So that's my own thing, you dig? I don't practice stuff that doesn't apply to me, you know? I don't, I don't, uh, if it, I have no practical use for it in my life, I don't bother. But, you know, you get a guy like uh, various people, like uh, one that comes to mind, I guess Winton was one of them, but and certain people, they, they record things like, uh, famous trumpet concertos, whether it's uh, uh, Haydn or whatever, I don't know what it's like, you know. But, uh, and, and then they get to like some part of it, they interpret it a little bit differently, you know, or they get to the cadenza, they play it a little bit differently. And then all of these classical, uh, arrogant, insecure guys sitting in their ivory towers in colleges, they start poo-pooing and went and marks out for, oh, did you see what he did to the, to the uh, cadenza, you know, like, hey, it's music. What the hell is he? He's not hurting anything. Probably Haydn would have rolled over and said, that's what I was looking for. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like we have you know, sometimes in, in certain fields of music, especially the classical field, it, there's no freedom for, for to being yourself. You have to be like, you know, occasionally a guy like Bud Herseth, who was, was such a powerful player, he had a particular way of being the principal player with Chicago Symphony for what, 52 years, I think it was, you know? Long and, time. Oh yeah, and he was such a power player that his voice was like the orchestra almost in many ways. And, the, and you get that the same sort of way with, with certain other players, but for the most part, the average guy that's playing assistant principal or third or second or whatever down the row, he's got to kiss ass and you know, you know, be quiet and, you know, do what everybody wants them to do. And, and I don't know, I mean, I've, I've hung out with a lot of these guys. I mean, some of them, Hogan Hardenberger, I met him when he was very, very young in, uh, in Sweden, you know, and hung out. A lot of these guys come to my clinics when I was over there, you know, <laughs> Jens Lindemann, I remember him up in Canada when he was about 15 years old and, and look at him now, what a player he is, you know, but, but I don't teach these guys to play, you see, but I can see there's variations in them. Like Hoken is a classical version of a jazz player in a sense, because he's looking for freedom within that genre of music. You know, he has people write pe pieces for him and, and he's, a, he's a very refined, controlled, d uh, unbelievable classical player but he's still looking for the freedom to play his voice, to have his voice. And that's really a hard thing to do, I think, in the field of classical music. But in, that's why I, I gravitated towards jazz. I played, you know, marches and stuff in school. But once I got out of high school and I went into college and I played in the college band, you know, a little bit, but we had no jazz band there. It was like mostly concert band and marching band and halftime shows, you know, and. We just, we just got hot water bottles full of rum and Coke and took them up in the stands and played. And by the time we went, by the time we went on to, to do the halftime show, we were so juiced, we had no idea what we were supposed to be doing. I used to, we're, 
they'd blow a whistle and I'd find myself standing next to a sousaphone player playing from March or something like that. Yeah. Good God, you know. But anyway, that's that's my whole thing. And I, I I'm a I believe that education needs revitalizing not only in the field of music, but I think it needs revitalizing in the in general in the field of languages, literacy and sciences and everything. You know, the average kid gets out of high school, he can't even change a tire on a car. Doesn't know how to doesn't know how to do anything with economics, knows nothing about the stock market, knows nothing about being a, a, a husband or a father, raising children, knows nothing about psychology and philosophy. You know, he goes to church on Sunday, drops a, a, a buck in a basket and goes home and tries to make love to his neighbor's wife, you know? I mean, what do you give me a break here? <laughs> Anyway, that's enough. I'm going to get in trouble with all of them. Yeah, we're gonna. You're gonna get us in trouble. Damn it! No, I'm gonna. No. You, I'm gonna get you out of. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. You know, I was just as you were talking. You know, it, there was a couple of questions that had been posted by the group, and you were talking about um, the fact that you didn't double or triple tongue. Um, Somebody did ask on the group, I forgot who it was, if you use doodle tonguing at all. And uh, I'm actually kind of curious to know that as well. Well, you can call it doodle tonguing in a sense, but the problem with something like that is when you, you know, like uh, Bob McChesney's famous trombone book on doodle tonguing, which is, which is a really wonderful book and all of that. But the, the thing about doodle tonguing is uh, that if you t if you take it as a like as a book thing and you try to apply it to a trumpet, it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. and no no no, you sound like a child on a in a playground. That's that's not the way you play. I was I'll give you a little story on this. I was in Japan many many years ago doing you know a tour and and uh, I did a, a clinic at the in the Yamaha thing in the Ginza. And there were, I think, about 500 trumpet players came to this thing, you know. And I had a translator from the Yamaha company there with me. And, and some kid raised his hand and asked a question. He says, uh, Mr. Bobby, uh, how you articulate for playing bebop with Toshiko? You know, and I went, good God, only in Japan would you get a question like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, I don't know, give me just a second. So I, I put the horn up here. And uh, so I closed my eyes and I played just a little. I went. And I imagined myself as a little guy about an inch tall sitting on my tooth over here on the left side on, the, on one of the molars and watching what was going on in my tongue inside of my mouth. Is it going? And no, it's going. And I went, da, light bulb, scat singing, it's scat singing. Now, when you get into scat singing, there are some people that scat sing well and some sing poorly. Most of the Caucasians go, ba 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 Oh my God, that wouldn't swing if you hung it from a tall tree, you know? So, the thing about scat singing is that you have to avoid certain double consonants like ba 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 ba, be 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 boo boo, or va 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 ba da 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 dee da do do. But doodle tonguing comes into doodle 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 dot, be doodle 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 dot dot. But you have vowel changes. But if you just go doodle 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 doodle, you're only going ooh. You see, there's no vowel change there. So if every note comes out, it sounds like a bat on an alarm system, you know? And so, but when you learn to scat sing, do the lead up, 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 do the lead up. Now, there was a great book now out of print, and I have a copy of it over there. It was written by or put together with Clark Terry. And, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but it, it has maybe a figure and it'll have four eighth notes. It'll, it'll go, do -do 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 -do. you have four eighth notes like that on, a, on the first two beats of a measure. 
And below it, Clark would have written, doodle do dot, doodle do dot, or something like that, you know? And so there's those four notes are all different, doodle do dot. They're all of different value. They all have a different pronunciation. That's sketchy singing, you know? If you go, if you go ta 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 ta, uh oh, too Caucasian. You dig? So that's where the problem is. And what a lot of the people that have studied classical art, they've been fully urbanized, you know, or Clark or Schlossberg or something. When they try <laughs> to come over to, to the jazz field and try to play, they are so ta 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 that they have a very difficult time trying to get rid of that white part of themselves, you know, and, and get into the, the phonetics that are required, you know, because the perfectionism thing is, it tightens them up and it doesn't allow that more kind of looser. I don't like to use the word relax, but it's a little looser, kind of like devil may care kind of approach to, to articulations, you know. So the whole thing about doodle tonguing is that it's if you say, oh, I want to learn to doodle tongue, and you go in the room and just go doodle, 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 doodle. No, 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 no. You've just wasted a whole lot of valuable practice time by learning something that has no uh, practical application. But you have to understand, like Dennis de Blasio, who's, you know, the flute, baritone sax player, teaches at Rowan College, just outside of Philadelphia. And Dennis was on Maynard's band, as you know, musical director, arranger, and all this stuff. Dennis has got some, on YouTube, some really good uh, videos about scat singing. And he's got a couple of books that Jamie Abersole, I think, publishes on Dennis's scat singing approaches, you know? And they get, they get you into the options that you have. Not everybody scat sings the same way. And if you listen to Sarah Vaughan or Carmen McRae or, or Eddie Jefferson or, you know, or dizzy or whatever, everybody's got their own kind of voice with this scat singing. But the, the style of doing it is very consistent. You don't, you're not gonna find Sarah Vaughn going, ba 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 No, she's not, no, no, no. Somebody's gonna run her out of town on that, you know? <laughs> so that, I hope that answers the guy's question about doodle singing. It's just not the way you approach it. You have. I wouldn't want to say one thing here that's probably one of the most important things I could probably say. And if, if we stop the whole interview right at this point, I mean, or after I say this, it, when people walked away with this, it would probably help them more than anything. And that is that you're not going to learn to play music by paper, by vision. It's not an I thing. There's parts of it like reading and stuff that are important, but it's an ear thing. And if you don't listen to a person play jazz, you will never understand it. If you don't listen to Count Basie play, you'll never understand what swinging is. If you just look at a page and you see four eighth notes on the first two bars I was demonstrating earlier, you're going to go ta 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 ta. You don't understand doodle doo dot that Clark Terry wrote out. And if you hear Basie play, if, if Basie's band is going to play doodle doo dot, Stan Kenton's band plays those same eighth notes, they're going to go, Ba ba do that, you know, same four notes. There's styles, you know. So I often, so I started a thing back in the 60s with band directors that I said, this is before CDs and stuff. I said, put, in that, put a, a record player, a turntable in your band room and get some Count Basie records, you know, especially Basie's the best one to start with, I think. Well, and then maybe some Woody Herman, but you, you, you don't want to, get complex you don't want to do stan kenton there's too many complexities with that you know right off the bat it's too orchestral you know but if you get count basie's band like atomic basie or basie plays hefty or one of those kind of things and you, when the kids are coming into the band room and they're getting their licking their reeds and getting their shit together to play if you put on a basie record but don't put it on so loud that they can't say how was your weekend or where did you get that mouthpiece or or, oh, that's a nice shirt or something that kids do. But put that Count Basie record at the, just at the level. So they're hearing it like kind of subconsciously, you think? And then they get their shit together. They get in the seats and you say, 
Uh, hi, kids. Nice to have you see you. Oh, by the way, I got on right now. That's what you're hearing is Count Basie. Before we start, let's listen to the rest of this track. It might be only another two minutes, but if you turn it up a little bit and they all sit there and go, wow, who is that Count Basie? No, we're a kid. You see that you're going to, you can't teach them that. You cannot teach those kids how to do that. They can learn it by ear, but they can't learn it by looking at it on the paper. So the whole process of, of auditory learning is, is paramount. It has to be the top thing. And then you can go down and look at what it, you can hear it and then look at it on the paper while you're hearing it on the, if a kid lo looks at his part on and Sammy Nestico chart while he's hearing Basie's band play it, he goes, oh my God. It's like a revelation to him, you know? But if he only sees it, he has no clue. So this is, and you, and I, one of the questions I know you mentioned in your email was one of the, the weakest parts of education is the ear training. They don't do enough stuff by ear. It's all visual. Don't miss that note. There. That's an A flat, you know, not an A natural, you know, you see that little mark, it's a natural sign or something or whatever. But if they, they need to hear stuff, that's how you learn stuff, you know. You don't learn to play basketball unless you watch the NBA games on TV or something, you know. You can't just have a ball and throw it at the side of the barn and expect to be any good. You have to go watch, you know, Michael Jackson. I mean, not Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan. And yeah, watch Michael Jackson with a basketball. That'd be <laughs> Probably not bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably couldn't hit the side of a barn. <laughs> So, Bobby, one of the questions that we had was um, somebody asked about uh, the album that you did with Carl Fontana, and that raises a question with me. The first time I met you, um, your Tom Harrell album that you guys did together, you said was in the can, and, and you were waiting for a label to, to release it, because I think yours and Chuck's had come out you know, just a little bit prior to that. So it, it raises a question to me, how do you prepare like stylistically, man, when I listen to you and Tom Harrell, there are times where I have a hard time remembering, oh, Bobby's on this side and Tom's on this side. Cause I mean, <laughs> you're, you're just such a, a chameleon when it comes to, to styles, you know, and then you sound different when uh, you're playing with Carl Fontana, you know, that album and, and so on. Do you prepare ahead of time or are your ears just taking you there in the moment? Yeah, everything is in the moment for me. I try to be, you know, uh, the thing about I play the same way. But what you're hearing is the fact that I I play off of and with other people. And uh, an interesting thing about improvising is that um you can learn to play, let's just say Autumn Leaves, you know. And if you learn to play it with Jamie Ebersole's rhythm section, whoever that is, it might be Jamie and, and uh, Todd Kuhlman and Ed Sof, I don't know, whoever. But, you know, so you play with that. And that's how you, as a young kid, you learn to play Autumn Leaves with, with that trio. Then you go into a club and you call up Autumn Leaves, but you have Cecil Taylor on piano and, and you know, uh, Miroslav Vitus on bass and, and uh, who knows who on, on drugs, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but the point being that you try to play with that trio and your solo is not going to work the same way because, you know, there's an interesting thing that an awful lot of people don't talk about in improvising. This is a, this is like four quarters equal a dollar, you know, and usually the guy, the one quarter that's got a saxophone or a trumpet in his hand thinks he's the only quarter. And the other three quarters are really dimes or nickels, you know. But, but I'm actually the dollar, really, you know. And it's not. It's a team effort at all times. It's communal. And even though, you know, I might be the, the, the soloist at that point, I'm still playing off of the way the rhythm section is supporting me and what they're feeding me. And of all of the things I've heard in my life, uh, like there's, 
Well, I'm, I'm selling my LP collection at the moment, so it's not completely full, but there's about 4,000 LPs over there, you know, and that's, those are my teachers in a way, all of the recordings I've listened to. So there's a lot of information in my head and a lot of versions of Autumn Leaves, you know, from Chet's version, you know, on the CTI or to, mm -hmm. to Lee Konitz's version or to Freddie Hubbard's version or whatever, or Clifford, you know, but they're all there. Now, which one's going to come up when I'm on the bandstand? Well, a lot of what comes up has to do with the way the rhythm section, what they're feeding me. So if a rhythm section is very busy, if a piano player is very busy clomping away and feeding me every chord and really active, I'm going, will you stop? I'm trying to play a solo over here, you know? I don't need a piano concerto going on while I'm trying to play a solo. I know the tune. I don't need to hear every chord. You dig? So don't feed me everything highlight. My favorite piano player in jazz is Wyndon Kelly because he was like the perfect highlighter, you know? He played solos like beautifully, but when he comped for people, whether it was Train or whoever it was, his comping, he just highlighted to help the audience hear where, what Train was doing, you know? Train, you don't have to show, hey, John, remember that's a G minor <laughs> seven coming up. <laughs> you don't have to show Coltrane what's coming up, you dig? So like the rhythm section can, can help you or deter your your thought processes when you're playing. And uh, the thing about putting putting all of this together as an improviser, you know, you 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 work as four quarters to equals a dollar. All people play together. Now, the group that I had for many years out in LA with Bill Mays on piano, Bob Magnuson, Dick Burke, and then we've had different drummers over the periods, but but that group and Gordon Brisker, you know, and and then eventually Bob Shepard on tenor and so forth. But man, that band and Patatucci on bass, are you kidding me? And Kay Akagi eventually on piano. Oh man. And though we played so many gigs together that we could read each other's minds. Bill Mays and I did an album that just actually got reissued on a Fresh Sound out of Barcelona, Spain. It's called Telepathy. And it's just a duo album. And we went into the studio and just piano and me and uh and an engineer <laughs> and we you know we, bill said what do you want to do i said i'm not sure uh and so we sat there and i put on a set on a stool and we turned the lights down and i i called up a tune i said um uh bye bye blackbird or something what key bill say well, i don't care what key you like to play them you know okay uh F minor, okay, or F major, or whatever, okay, okay, fine, and uh, and so we tell Jim Mooney, the engineer, okay, roll them, and Bill say, how do you want to do this? I say, I don't know, just get started, I'll follow you, you know, and he would start, and then we would play, and we recorded, I don't know, maybe five or six hours. We did two sessions, probably at least maybe a seven hours of recorded music, and. The thing about it is that we never rehearsed anything. We never did two takes on anything. It was all spontaneous in the moment, you know? And that's the way this music, that's the biggest challenge. Drop your trousers and see what you got, you know? Like, don't prepare. And the preparation, it's like planning a solo. Oh, I'm gonna, I wanna write out a really good solo. Well, if you write that out and play that on a record, people are gonna go, that's the worst solo I've ever heard in my life, you know, because it didn't happen in the moment. You follow what I mean? There's something spiritual about being in the now, not the future or the past. Having the courage, the confidence that you build up over years and years of, of training properly to where the, that you are, you're not afraid of the right wrong issue, you know, the clam thing that I talked about earlier, the, the 11th commandment, thou shalt not clam, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it takes, it takes years of, of learning and building confidence, and, but you need to be encouraged by, once again, we're back to the, to the early years of growing up in a band room where the band director doesn't point fingers at you, but he 
puts his arms around you and says, you're fine. You're not yet. Don't you worry about it. You know, I mean, the kid goes out and plays his first solo and you can go to him and you say, you can say, uh, how I would, when a kid plays the first little solo, I wouldn't go to him and say, Oh, that was just great. That was just great. Joey, you just, Oh, that was just so great. It was not great. Abraham Lincoln was great. Jonas Salk was great, but that kid's solo was not great. You know, <laughs> Ferrari is a great car. A lot of is not a great car, <laughs> but you take the see, Don't use the word great <laughs> in a wrong place, but I would I would do to that little Joey after he played the solo and say, "How'd you do?" And he'd say, "Oh my God, I, I was so scared." I say, hey, "That's normal. We all get scared when we start this stuff. You know, it's okay. You you, you didn't do it. That's fine. But did you have any fun? Well, yeah, it was kind of fun. Well, that's what it's all about, little Joey. <sighs> get in there and have another solo and have a little bit more fun. You know, and now if you can." create that kind of an environment in the band room, you're going to have all kinds of kids wanting to learn to play. And they're going to, they're all going to be self-confident and they're not going to be living in this state of fear. I did a, a festival up in the state of, um, in, in Vancouver, British Columbia many years ago. Um, and there, it came down to two bands. One of the bands was from Bellevue High School in, in Washington, Bellevue, Washington. And the other band was North Vancouver High School. And the Bellevue band came out there like a Norman Rockwell painting all with their little ties and everything like very stoic. And they played some charts and everything was really like clean and polished and everything. But it was so Caucasian, it was unbelievable. And then like the little North Vancouver band, which I think three of the four trumpet players were girls and they were like tiny and they were standing on orange grades, you know? And, but they got up there and they played and they were wiggling their ass and they'd be smiling and they were having a great time. And they, they, they were just so much more music coming off of them. And then we were like, there was, there was six of us judges, you dig? Judges, ooh. You know, so <laughs> it came down to voting on the, which one of the bands won. And three of us picked North Vancouver, three picked Bellevue. And then we had to go back in the room and discuss this, you see, and try to pick a winner. And I was actually not one of the judges. I was the guest artist, but they asked me to, Bobby, why don't you join us as a judge, you know? So that made an even number of judges. Never do that. Always have an odd number. So it can never tie. Mm -hmm. But we went in the back room and talked about this. And these three of these judges were typical Caucasian band directors, you know, uh, uptight, you know, and they said, well, that, the, the Bellevue band was like clean and polished and they didn't miss any notes or anything. And the other kids were, they were sloppy and all that. And I said, what the hell is the difference? Go to Appalachia sometime and sit around with some hot dogs, marshmallows, and a few banjo players and listen to what they play. What the hell? That's got more energy and more life to it than somebody sitting with a violin solo locked in a closet someplace, you know? You, you dig, and, and I couldn't get through to these band directors, so I withdrew myself as a judge from the thing. And of course, the Bellevue band won. But I thought, my God, the, the judges, the band directors don't even know. And this is really like, that's like going to in for surgery and saying, hey, doc, what was your grade? What was your report card grade? Ah, D, you ain't touching me. <laughs> you know, I don't want a doctor cutting on me. He got a D on his report card. <laughs> and I don't want a band director trying to teach my kids that he got a D on his report card. You know, you know, it's it's like it's the funniest thing in the world. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to my grave shouting about all this crap. But but the thing about it, is, <laughs> what I what I care about is this music. I care about this music. <laughs> Just, I mean, really more than damn near anything in my life. I care about clean air, the ozone layer and the environment and all those things. And I hate to see people warring and arguing and fighting and shooting each other. I hate all that. But, you know, underlying all of this, my life is all centered around music. And I love it so much that, that my, I could have been an architect and made 10 times the money, you know, but... I couldn't have had any fun like I've had, you know. I couldn't have gotten into arguments with Buddy Rich or Benny Goodman, you know. And who wants to miss that? 
<laughs> so, you know, that I hope that answers that that little question about like and your answer. I mean, it's a long answer. I warned you, Paul. But you asked, <laughs> about, you asked me about, but you know, Chuck Finley and Carl and all that. I I played the same way. It's still me, and people can always recognize that it's me. It seems, you know, but. The style fits, I play off of Carl, I play off of Chuck, you know? When we did the album with uh, Tom Harrell and I, when Tom and I were in the studio listening to playbacks, you know, before we had it panned separately, you know? Tom would, we're standing there listening to a playback and Tom would lean to me and he'd say, was that you or was that me? And I'd say, I don't know. <laughs> and we got so compatible together you know, that he was trying to copy me and I was trying to copy him, you know, and we found that there was the right, a nice center. And that's what happens is when you play together, you find a center. You find you're still individual players, but you center and you feel that there is a, it's a marriage between me and Carl or me and Chuck or me and Tom Harrell. And, you know, one of the guys I talked to about doing two people I wanted to do albums with in my life. One was Jack Sheldon, the other was Art Farmer. And Art passed away before we got a chance to, to do it. And, and then I moved out of LA and, and I never got a chance to do it with Jack. But Jack and I were on Benny Goodman's band together and we used to sit next to each other. And when I lived in LA, I used to go over to Charlie O's every Wednesday night and hear Jack Sheldon play, you know? And, and uh, yeah, it was, it was so, funny to hear him you know because he's he was such an inspiration to me as a kid you know and to hear him play and he uh, you know once I'd be in there with a, a table full of trumpet players listening to Jack and and on the break Jack would say like uh, between tunes he'd say ladies and gentlemen right over here we have we have the world's absolute greatest jazz trumpet player in the world Bobby Sue Sitting next to him is the world's absolute greatest jazz trumpet player in the world, Chuck Finley. And sitting next to Chuck <laughs> is the world's absolute greatest jazz trumpet player in the world. And he would go, it would be like <laughs> seven guys that he'd introduce us all in the same. <laughs> I loved him. You know? I mean, anyway, oh, wow, enough, cool. said, enough said about that. I would have loved to have just recorded stories between you and Jack. Oh, God. You know, it, we were on Benny Goodman's band and we were playing and it was a funny thing because Benny was such an odd character to work for, you know, even his daughter in an interview said she never figured out her own father, you know, but uh, I think he was bipolar. It was before they knew that term, you know, but, but Benny was a challenge and Jack was the, in the trumpet section uh, and um, I was playing lead and Benny made me play all the lead and all the solos, all the Harry James solos and everything. He wouldn't let anybody else play anything. And, and Jack was the comic. And we'd do a little bit, and Jack, and Jack would go out front and do his grease finger thing and all of that stuff, you know, that he was <laughs> for, you know. But when Jack would go out front and do his comedy act, Benny would come back and sit in Jack's chair, and, and I would be playing music before Jack, and Benny would like sit like this. He'd stare right at me, and he's like, here staring i'm trying to play and benny's like the ray the famous ray he's like yeah. <laughs> i'm sitting there playing and benny's like raying into me and then and then sometimes when when we were playing in the section then jack would be sitting next to me and we're playing and jack's not playing he's got the horn in his lap i'd say uh, are you gonna play he says no nah, i just like listening to you play <laughs> what the hell you're playing the second book play <laughs> you, know, you know but uh jack was he was, he was just a uh, he was the funniest guy man he was such a great player you know this you know this business i one of the things i have to say is that i'm so fortunate the fact that i was i wasn't born early enough to be in the 40s big band era you know but I was born early enough to play on like a lot of the bands like the Tommy Dorsey band and, and, uh, and Woody's band and Buddy Rich's band and Cy Zittner's band and, 
and I, I played on Louis Belson's band for 33 years. I played on Louis, uh, played lead book on uh, Al Porcino's old book on Terry Gibbs' band for 32 years, you know? I mean, I played on Bob Florence's band. I played some with Bill Holman's band before Carl Sanders showed up in town, you know, and all that. But I mean, I had the chance to play on all of these different things, to play with Art Pepper, to play with Horace Silver, you know, to play with Frank Roslino and all of those kinds of guys and Carl. And man, you know, I mean, I look back and I have to pinch myself and say, God, is it luck? And people say, Bob, Bobby was a really lucky guy. Well, I want to show you something about a definition for the word luck, and you'll love this. Absolutely. Yeah. You think that? That's very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. You and know, Bobby, I saw you uh, sit in with Art Farmer. I think it was 1980, I want to say 82, 83. You came to do, um, I guess, two days at Western Washington University way back. Uh, Sid Potter was the jazz director okay, then. Yeah, Sid Potter, yeah. I'm yeah, sure. and uh, I, I was... Uh, I was the lucky guy. I got to drive you around in my piece of shit. I mean, uh, my junky little Volkswagen Beetle. Oh, and, you mean uh, that piece of shit? Yeah. That, <laughs> <laughs> you remember it. <laughs> and and we went down to Seattle. I think uh, it might have been Tula's or I'm not sure what it was. But uh, it, wasn't our, Tula, it was the other one. Uh, the, um, Jazz Alley, maybe? Uh, no, uh, there was another one there. Parnell's? No, it was before that. Oh, no, it wasn't. Or after that? Oh, I, I can almost picture it, but uh... yeah, 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 yeah. I can. Oh. I can. The name of it's right on the tip of my tongue too. I, I heard Monty Alexander and Slide Hampton there. It was Floyd Standifer used to work that song. Yes, out. that's right, Floyd. Yeah. Oh, the New Orleans. No. No, no, no. It was something. Mm. It was. Ah, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I saw. Anyway, sorry, and you sat in with Art Farmer. Man, what a what a night that was. God. Well, you you know, Art Farmer was a huge influence on me, especially with regard to the flugelhorn, you know. The first flugelhorn player I actually heard knowing it was the flugelhorn was Shorty Rogers, you know, but Shorty wasn't enough of a jazz player to inspire me with thoughts or ideas or anything like that. I knew Chet played on a flugelhorn a little bit, uh, and I have, I actually have a Martin flugelhorn in my collection, you know, that's a very, very rare. That's what most of those guys played back before Queen Anne be uh, became so famous and do so dominant, you know, but, um, uh, you know, Art in very strongly influenced my flugelhorn playing and, and his playing in general. My wife, who we're going to be married 58 years coming up now, uh, but my wife, I took her to hear Art Farmer at the Parisian Room in L.A. one time, you know, and she was always a big a jazz fan and very knowledgeable about it. My wife actually heard Clifford Brown play live a couple of times, you know, wow. which I was never able to do. But, uh, and one of the reasons I thought maybe if I marry her, maybe she can sing back a couple of his solos to me. Or something. <laughs> anyway, I took, I took Lisa down to hear Art Farmer one time and it was the first time that I had taken her to, to meet him and everything. And my wife is quite upfront with things, you know, she does not hold back at all. And so, as I said, Art, this is my wife, Lisa. And so is, they were shaking hands. Lisa says, you know, one of the reasons I married Bobby is because of you. And he says, really? And, and, and he says, how so? And she says, well, I, I, when I heard him play, he reminded me of your playing. And I thought, that's good enough for me. You know? So I went, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, never, I never knew that, you know, but... But Art and I hung out. He took he his uh, he got hit in the mouth with a bungee cord on his wife's. His wife was ill in a hospital bed, and the bungee cord took, flipped up and hit him on the lip and cut his lip open. Hmm. And we worked on the same. We worked on toured in Europe with the same booking agent, Ernie Garside, and uh, so we stayed at Ernie's house and we were there simultaneously. And Art showed me some of the problems he was having with his lip and. This, the thing was healing, but he was having some, he had cut the, severed the, the tissue, you know? So Art took a few lessons with me and we sat in the room, you know, and I'm showing him to do some isometric buzzing and fluttering and getting blood flowing. And a lot of guys, I have to say in all honesty, 
the, the majority of the trumpet players, I mean, brass players in general, and I mean, you could spread it into flute and saxophones or whatever. But the average musician doesn't know peas from potatoes about anything about the body, about the muscles and how they work. And very few people know how the respiratory system works, you know, and, you know, and Bobby Medina, he knows uh, very clearly how much I'm into the science of all of the physiology and anatomy of the body. I mean, I got into that because of Maynard giving me that, that uh, breathing book years ago, but, but that it's a thing with art farmer. I was, I'm sitting there saying, am I, am I giving art farmer a lesson? You know, <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, you know, but then two and a half years ago, Doc Severinsen took a, a two hour lesson with me online, you know, and I thought, what? I, what, what can I possibly show Doc Severinsen, you know? Well, what I did show him was a better way to flutter his facial muscles to get better blood flow further out into the muscles and, and showed him a few things about lip buzzing, which were more effective. And so, you know, and Kathy, uh, Kathy Leach, who he resides with, said that as soon as the lesson was over, he ran down to the practice room and practiced for a couple of hours all the shit I'd showed him, you know? So I was so honored that Doc would even spend two hours with me, but I've known him since I was 16 years old. So we've been good friends all over the years, but I'm always humbled when somebody of that caliber, you know, even Wayne Bergeron and people like that, and Warwick Miyashiro and all of these wonderful players. You know, Roger Ingram was 14 when he started studying with me, you know, and I'm, I'm just humbled when people come to me. They, but I, I wish more and more people understood, you know, for me, the biggest breakthrough in my teaching and my life as a player was when I started realizing that it was important to study anatomy and physiology and start understanding what the hell is a muscle? How does it work? And what, if it damages, what makes it better and whatever, how do you do what, how does, how does it all work? You know? And then right about the same time I started studying that, I went with Yamaha that's 46 years ago. And so I'm, you know, I've done some stuff before with Olds and Reynolds with Northern music and all of that before, but, with Yamaha and working with Bob Malone and Kenzo Kawasaki and so forth in Japan, I've learned an awful, a fair amount about, you know, how horns work and, you know, things like that. So, you know, they don't, you don't, it's kind of hard to fool me these days, you know, I mean, 